World of Warcraft is known for many things. Legendary expansion trailers, memorable raiding experiences, that one South Park episode. This sword can completely drain his mana. Dad, how did you get that? No time. But one thing it's infamous for is its insanely high skill ceiling in PvP. Whether it's your first time stepping into the arena or you're a seasoned veteran, while PvP can get overwhelming, especially if you aren't armed with the proper tools and knowledge for success. That's why today I've put together a list of tips and tricks to help you improve your game. These tips are compiled from countless Reddit posts, interviews with many gladiators I've played with personally, questions I've had answered by your favorite streamers, and my own thousands of hours poured into the game. We will move from general tips, to add-ons, to class-specific notes, to DPS tips, and finally, to healer tips. So buckle in, and let's get into it before I make this intro longer than a solo shuffle queue. Tip number one is play whatever the WoW PvP subreddit is complaining about and rake in the most easy wins. Tip number one. If you find out you're doing something in an inefficient way, don't be afraid to tear down and rebuild your UI, keybinds, etc. in a better way, even if it temporarily makes you worse at the game. Some people have terrible UI or terrible binds and they don't even know it. Oh my god. Whether they are giving themselves way too much information or are using bizarre out of the way hotkeys over just adding modifiers to comfortable binds, sometimes you're setting yourself up for failure. There is seven blind icons on this screen right now. Most often I think this becomes apparent for people when transitioning from traditional hotkeys to arena 123 hotkeys. Having three buttons for every utility ability can throw a wrench in most people's flow who aren't used to it. But if you just optimize your UI, find comfortable binds, and utilize control alt shift modifiers, you will notice a big difference in performance. Not dexterous enough to use many keybinds? Consider getting an MMO mouse. The key here is to start small, only show or bind the bare essentials, and slowly build up from there. Tip number two, if you are new to a class or a spec and you don't know what to choose for your talents, check the arena leaderboards. Top players in your region often know what's best. Most top WoW players even stream, make videos, or have discords, giving you the opportunity to ask more direct questions. And if you want to save some time, something I always do when learning a new class or spec, and even sometimes when I'm very familiar with a spec, is use the website murloc.io. Murloc.io puts together easily understandable charts for gear, gems, enchants, and talents based on the averages from the top 50 players on any given spec. That 50 player average can be a lot more convenient than just copying the top players because it gives perspective on viable picks. No spec uses the same talents no matter what they play against. Murloc.io tells you the absolute must-haves, the interchangeables, and the unpickables all in one based off the top 50 players in your region. Tip number three is to use knockback on big casts as a pseudo kick. You can actually use any CC as a pseudo kick, but most of the time you want to use your real CC for locking the enemy out on your kill window. Since knockback is the only kind of CC that is both instant and doesn't lock the enemy out of taking action, consider using it to interrupt big spells. Of course, on certain maps you can use knockback as lockout CC if there's relevant elevation, like on Mukambala, Blade's Edge, or even on Dollar and Sewers. On those maps, a knockback can completely remove one or more enemies from line of sight. So, those of you playing Hunter, Shaman, Druid, Mage, Monk, or Evoker, make sure you are getting the most out of your knockbacks because one good knockback can completely decide who's gonna win the game. Tip number four, learn how classes and comps interact. You'll never be able to stop or create a go if you don't understand the steps. For example, if you're playing Assassination Rogue and you try to be a hero against Cupid comp, that being Rhett, Hunter, and Priest, and Hunter doesn't have Exhilaration or Turtle, Rhett has Bubble but doesn't have Bop, and Priest doesn't have Trinket or Human Racial. It seems like the kill target is pretty clear. But if you start your go with a full kidney on the healer, intending to blind after the stun ends, maybe even get a cheeky sap afterwards and then try to kill the Hunter with Mark for Death into every button plus Death Mark, you might be confused when the Hunter doesn't die because the healer is suddenly not stunned at all because you didn't know what Blessing of Sanctuary was. Inversely, from identifying what your win condition is, we'll be identifying the enemy kill condition. In this example, Cupid Comp is a setup-based comp usually revolving around Hodge into Trap into Fear on the healer. Identifying only this entry-level information can help increase the rogue's win percentage by a large margin, as now, he may be prepared to CC the Hunter at the end of the Hodge on your healer to give your healer some wiggle room and make the trap that much more difficult to land. Of course, since this is a 3v3 scenario, not every single responsibility to achieve a win should fall on your shoulders alone. Rely on your teammates and know what their toolkits are. This tip segues perfectly into our next two tips. Tip number five is to play alts to help you with game knowledge, but at the same time, 
focus on one class to grind on. Think of it like having a main account and a smurf account for typical ranked shooter games. One account is for progressing and sweating, the others are for practice and learning to supplement the main account. If you are an experienced WoW player who already has a firm grip on the many spells and talents varying through the classes, then multi-classing may be more accessible to you and help you find what's most comfortable. For newer players, however, I would highly recommend sinking no less than 70-80% to 80 of your playtime into one class and honing it to perfection. This will lead to much less learning pains and allow you to acclimate over time at a much more exponential rate. Tip number 6 is information gathering. If Rhett pops wings and it takes you two globals to respond, you'll never break past 2k. You have to react immediately. It's like walking into a street fight with your arms down and your chin out. If he gets two free swings, you just lost the fight. But be prepared to block, counter, CC, or anything. Just react. As time moves on, you will get better at deciding when and how to react, but the important thing is to respect enemy cooldowns. This is where the information gathering comes in, and add-ons can help you out a ton with that. Depending on how you tune Omnibar, Gladius, S Arena, you should be able to track all relevant enemy cooldowns at once. If you know what damage is coming, or even potentially when it's coming, that information can save your life and win the game for your team. Tip number seven is don't be stingy with your cooldowns. The worst thing you can do is think, I'm full HP, I'll be fine. Damage comes fast in this game. If someone uses a 20% damage buff and you or your healer don't use a wall, GG. There is no worse feeling than dying, not just with the defensive available, but when you have a complete immunity button, such as Paladin's Bubble Up, or you have the Hunter's Aspect of the Turtle Up. For those of you familiar with the MOBA scene, it's like dying late game with your ult up. You know the respawn time is going to be long, and your ult would be off cooldown by the time you get back to the battlefield. You might as well use it in an effort to help your team secure a win in the team fight or on the objective. Except in WoW's case, when you die, that's just it. You died without doing everything in your power to help your team win. While you are improving and still learning about your class, you should feel free to be a little bit more trigger happy with your abilities. The longer you play and the more experience you get, the more refined your plays will be in choosing the right time to trade abilities and when not to. Tip number eight you might have heard a lot, it's film your games. Find what you or your partner could have done differently. Did you interrupt something that didn't need to be interrupted? Did you miss a trap? Did you hold CC too long? Maybe you're a rogue and you could have popped Vanish for an extra garrote silence that would have supplied your kill window with the extra few seconds it needed to seal the deal. It's small stuff like this that'll make or break a match. Removing yourself from the stress of the driver's seat can help you analyze what's really going on. Watching gameplay for me is the absolute best way to learn how to play better. It doesn't even have to be your own gameplay. When learning a new class or just trying to hone perfection on a class, I often find myself watching pro players streaming on that class. While watching your own gameplay will help you focus on the exact issues you specifically are struggling with, watching a pro player can help you identify what the ideal conditions are to avoid making the mistakes you see in your own matches. Tip number nine is playing by the script. People often refer to how certain comps play as the script, and oftentimes the first team to break the script can lose. Oftentimes, thinking about how your composition wants to win before you start your arena can be what makes or breaks the game progression, and most of the time, there is an objectively correct answer. The problem here is many teammates you'll find yourself playing with will ruin the script for you and refuse to admit their faults, and thus your team avoids fixing their mistakes. To find your own faults first is the best way to present a change in game plan. For example, after a loss, you might say, Yeah, I think I used my defensive prematurely on their go. Or, If I just saved my CC for the go at the end there, we would have definitely won that. My bad, guys. Many players are easier to let up on their internet pride if you are the first to talk about what you think went wrong for yourself. This social strategy alone may be the quickest way to helping your team improve upon and address their mistakes. Tip number 10 is change your playstyle for your team comp. These are simple changes you can implement that have a huge impact. Don't blind or scatter off dots. If you're playing with a Fist Weaver against melee, don't ignore your Mist Weaver's Fey line. Don't reapply dots to the Sheep or Blind target. If you're with a Rogue, let them sap. Don't just rush in and let everyone flag for combat immediately. If you're with a Warlock, don't zug zug in before they can set up their portals. If a hunter or mage lands a trap or polymorph, let it sit. Don't break their CC. Pay attention to when they're casting their CC. If you're playing with a stealthy as a non-stealthy, for the love of God, do not walk on top of them and give away their position. Tip number 11 is to track enemy CDs. There are many add-ons that can help you with this for efficient swapping and trading. Some spells' visual effects are much more obvious than others. Some are barely noticeable at all. Tracking enemy CDs, both offensive and defensive, can help you stay alive longer. 
and locate kill windows quicker. Knowing when big damage is coming your way by tracking enemy cooldowns can prep you to hit your defensive. In the same way, knowing when your enemy is out of defensives and have no answers to anything that you may dish out is the best time to pour in your damage. This dynamic leads to a dance of cooldown trading between you and your opponent to position yourself in such a way to still be holding on to damage after having scared the enemy into using all of their defensives. Tip number 12 is CCing the healer is almost always the highest value you can get out of your CC. This is of course not a concrete rule and it can be situational. It holds mostly true in 3v3s but holds less water in 2v2s. Reason being generally, in 3v3s, you are almost never going to be targeting the healer, and the healer provides the most tools to keep their team alive. You should generally be using CC on whichever target is going to keep you from killing your kill target the most. Fortunately, since you have two teammates in 3s, you can often CC both the off target, being the healer in most cases, and your kill target simultaneously. One for the healer to keep from healing, and one for the kill target to keep from popping defensives. But of course, that too is situational. However, the same rule of CCing whoever is keeping your kill target alive applies in 2s as well. However, 2s are much more comp dependent than 3s are. So the CC priority switches from in 3s generally being used on the healer to in 2s having to identify the kill target based on comp. Tip number 13 is track DRs. If the same or similar crowd control effect is reapplied to a PvP target within 18 seconds of the CC effect ending, the crowd control spell will be under the effect of a diminishing return, or DR. The first time the CC effect is reapplied within 18 seconds after it ends, the duration of the crowd control effect will only be 50% of its original duration. This extends into learning your teammates' CC profiles. It's important to know which CCs lie within the same CC school so you don't waste your CCs and further postpone your kill window. If you're playing with a rogue who generally leads and secures their kill window with a stun, don't waste that stun DR on an in-cap totem or a chaos nova just because you have it off CD. If you're playing with a priest, lock, or a rogue as a mage, then don't DB to secure any polymorph on the off target because it will start the disorient DR on any blind spheres or psychic screams. Figuring out the CC profile of your arena teammates can help maximize the amount of CC that you can apply to the enemy. Tip number 14 is to find an interrupt priority. Don't waste your kicks on bad casts and find what spells you should be waiting to kick. Inversely, bait kicks with fake casts from non-priority schools. Do not ever let enemies cast CC for free. They are usually highest interrupt priority. For example, if a demo lock is trying to get damage off, like when they have Nether Portal activated for example, you might think it a good idea to kick Shadow Bolt to stop Shadow Casts. However, Shadow is not the only school a demo lock uses. They also use Shadow Flame which when kicked locks out of shadow and fire. Shadow Bolt is only used by demo locks to generate soul shards, which are then spent themselves doing the real damage. Nether Portal is big for demo locks because every soul shard spent summons a demon from the portal. A lock may try to cast fear to be able to make space to cast Hand of Gul'dan, which summons two imps per two shards cast, but be aware that too can be a bait. Fear is a shadow spell, and if you kick that CC and have no follow-up answer, then the lock can now spam Hand of Gul'dan on the nether portal for a huge amount of minions. Kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Kicking Shadow Bolt locks Shadow, kicking Fear locks Shadow, but kicking Hand of Gul'dan locks Shadow and Fire and there's nothing else the Warlock can do until that interrupt is ended. For this reason, the correct answer is, if after the nether portal is dropped, the lock casts Hand of Gul'dan, kick that, because Shadow Flame removes the whole kit. Hand of Gul'dan is almost the highest CC priority right next to Fear, situationally. If after the Nether Portal is dropped they cast Fear instead of Hand of Gul'dan, instant CC may be the better answer, along with waiting out the remainder of Nether Portal to mess up their whole go. Spammable CC is definitely the ideal way to go here, like DB into poly spam for about 14 seconds combined of CC. But without spammable CC, you could cast just a single use crowd control and then proceed to run away and line of sight until another portal is gone. As you can see, interrupts can be a little tricky on paper and even more difficult to figure out on the fly. This is why finding your interrupt priority beforehand is absolutely key. Tip number 15 is a simple one. Don't use gap closers while mounted. Warriors, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Tip number 16. It's a quick one. Do you hate arena dialogue? Of course you do. Friends, so does everybody else. Just click on a different monitor or put which. anything else in focus, even alt-tabbing works, then refocus WoW. 
no more arena dialogue. Easy peasy. Tip number 17 is to use a macro to change the names over enemy nameplates into the number designating what arena target they are. If you want your bars to have little numbers on them for efficient arena target swapping, just use this macro on screen now at the start of each arena to instantly change the names on nameplates to arena numbers. Don't want to type it out? No problem. Just copy and paste it from my Discord, which can be found right here. Please, please join my Discord. Please. Tip number 18, don't CC for no reason. Nobody is more hated than the Resto Druid, who clones the kill target when they are low and your whole team is sitting over 80% HP, and then they complain about being hard stuck 1500. Nor is anyone worse than the Paladin throwing out random blinds and stuns, ruining their rogue's win condition. CC has a purpose, and it should only be used to secure slash set up a kill window, or to help your team survive longer via peeling to have another chance at reaching that kill window. Simply put, CC with intention. Tip number 19, positioning is half the battle in arenas. There are many, many rules and nuances that go into who should be where in an arena match, and I could honestly make an entire video on this point alone. The basics boil down to basically this. If you are a ranged class, then playing in the open is your best friend, as there's ideally nowhere to LOS your spells and abilities. If you are melee, then the pillar is your best friend because it does allow you to LOS incoming enemy spells and abilities. Keep this in mind as you size up your opponents to decide where you should position yourself. If you're ranged playing against range, then you still might favor the pillar, especially if you are in a disadvantaged state, such as having low HP or missing the required CDs to secure a kill window. If you are melee playing against melee, then it matters much less where the damage dealers are positioned, rather it matters more where their healers are positioned. You can't very well LOS a melee player, but you can mount up and stay on the opposite side of the pillar from them for all eternity. You can also bait melee players around pillars to make them LOS their own healers. This is because all healers are ranged, except for fist weavers, and when kiting an enemy player, you should be attempting not only to keep yourself safe with positioning, but to make it as difficult as possible for the enemy healer to do their job well. Alright, out of general tips, we're on to tip 20. Add-ons, whether you think it's good or bad, add-ons pretty much make up the entirety of what PvP has become. Running arenas without add-ons is a lot like trying to drive at night in a storm with no headlights. Technically doable, but it will be a lot more difficult and you're gonna need to be extremely talented or lucky to pull it off. I went ahead and notated all of my preferred add-ons to help you find a baseline for what's necessary and what's not. So I'm just gonna run through them real quick. Omnibar, it shows when enemy kicks are on cooldown. It can also show any cooldown you want it to track. When set up properly, you can assume any ability not currently visible on Omnibar your enemy has ready to go. Omni CD lets you track the cooldowns of your teammates. This lets you know at all times if both your teammates have the cooldowns needed to secure a kill rather than just knowing what you have. It's also fantastic for analyzing footage after the fact to find out what could have been done better by all parties. Omni CC simply turns all analog timers into digital ones. It adds numbers that count down to all items, spells, and abilities that are on cooldown to indicate when they will be ready to use again. Gladius X and S Arena I grouped together because most people may use one or the other since they perform basically the same task of making the default enemy arena raid frames more usable and useful, but I actually use both because each add-on handles different things in slightly different ways. Ultimately, I layer both of these add-ons to be used at the same time, and it helps me keep track of all the CDs and DRs on my enemies in a way that is most pleasing to my eyes. Big Debuffs is an extremely lightweight add-on that hooks to the Blizzard raid frames to increase the debuff size of crowd control effects. Additionally, it replaces unit frame portraits with debuff durations when important debuffs are present. Details is the best number tracker you could possibly have in World of Warcraft. Doesn't matter if it's PvP, PvE, or anything else, it tracks damage, healing, interrupts, CC in their uptime, DPS and HPS, kills and deaths, as well as what led to them, damage absorbed, healing absorbed, dispels, and so, so much more. Not only that, but it will track these things for your last very many encounters. So if you want to know exactly how you died to a comp that you fought 10 matches ago, which you just happened to re into, down to the 10th of a second, you can do exactly that and find quickly what you need to avoid. Weak Auras is a powerful and flexible framework that allows you to display highly customizable graphics on World of Warcraft's user interface to indicate buffs, debuffs, and other relevant information. Sometimes I make my own Weak Auras that simply shine a symbol at me, so I always know when I have kick available and I don't have to look down on my bars. Other times, probably the most popular Weak Aura 
is the healer CC weak aura, which I've modified a bit. So I always know whenever I have a teammate who's CC'd and if I can use Blessing of Sanctuary to save them. Voodoo is about displaying the health of party members in a form of clearly arranged bars. Voodoo is primarily directed to healing classes, but it will make use to almost any class, especially those that utilize their utility. Moreover, several healing spells or other actions can be asserted to mouse clicks on those bars, and they also function with mouse over macros. Smart Tab Target automatically switches your tab targeting between nearest enemy and nearest enemy player based on your PvP status. Diminished DR Tracker. It attaches icons to unit frames or nameplates, displaying time left until a crowd control diminishing return category expires for that unit, as well as how far the category is diminished. You don't need this in the arena for your enemies as Gladius X and S Arena can do that for you, but I use this add-on to track DRs on my target and world PvP and battlegrounds, as well as tracking the DRs on myself, so I can know when to expect more incoming CC. Trophy GCD can show spells used, as they're used, in the order they're used, whether you cast them or your party did. This is mostly useful for content creators who want their audience to learn from their plays and rotation, or for those looking to improve by studying their own games they've recorded. Battleground enemies can be used in PvP scenarios outside of Battlegrounds, but I mostly use it in Battlegrounds because it tracks all enemy health bars, whether or not they are in your line of sight, if they are CC'd or not, as well as how many party members are targeting them. This is an invaluable add-on for any organized rated Battleground groups. I would say this add-on isn't generally usable in arenas on their own, but the one mechanic that it does have that might be helpful to new players is, once again, telling you how many party members are targeting each enemy. Especially newer players who are introducing themselves to PvP via solo shuffle, this can help you figure out who you need to attack so your DPS is never split. Now on to class-specific tips that are sure to assist you whether you are playing as the classes mentioned or against them. Bringing us to tip 21, mages. Did you miss your Ring of Frost? Just blast wave back into it. You can also cast it from mass invis so enemies won't be able to see it. So if you open up on this priest, I'll do the mass invis ring on top. So if a rogue tries to intervene, he'll literally just step into it. That's, that's yep. the plan. Hopefully it works. Okay, I guess I'm here. I'm ready to go. Down. Rings down. Stepped into it. He did it. <laughs> Nasty. That's right. In case you were not aware, when an enemy mage casts Ring of Frost from Mass Invisibility, you will never be able to see Ring of Frost on your screen, no matter how long it's there. This is probably the answer if you find yourself getting randomly frozen against mages. Also, apparently, you can use mirror images to counter a DK's grabby hands, also known as Abomination Limb. However, if you are fighting mages, keep in mind that Alter Time does not automatically activate when the duration is up. This spell must be reactivated to return to the point it was originally cast. Which means, any CC that can predict when the mage wants to return to their save point can completely ruin their planned escape and cause them to panic or burn CDs which they wanted to save. Tip number 22 goes out to Warlocks. Casting Havoc as a Destro Warlock on a target while having Grimora sacrifice your Fell Hunter will allow you to kick both your main target and your Havoc target simultaneously. Also, Casting Eye of Killrog, then quickly pressing the escape key, will immediately teleport your pet back to your side instantly, no matter where they are in the arena. Tip number 23, Warrior. Quit heroic leaping off your mount to the enemy as soon as the gates open. As with most melee classes, the pillar is your best friend, but it's especially your best friend when playing against ranged classes. In this scenario, Ideally, you won't ever want to leave Pillar unless you have Stormbolt, Spell Reflect, and Heroic Leap off cooldown. But most important is just don't Heroic Leap to chase anyone. Save it to get back to your Pillar. Your goal is to just survive long enough until Dampening allows your Mortal Strike and Execute to delete someone. I've also found that a Spear build works best against pesky double range comps, whereas the Bleed build destroys melee cleave. Tip number 24, Shaman. You can take advantage of using Thunderstorm to blast healers out of line of sight from their DPS, and then use Root Totem into Static Field Totem to keep healers from being able to do their job. This can surprise braindead melees without noticing that they are out of range for their healers to heal. Tip number 25, Rogue. Rogues can use Distract on mages to make them face the wall, then sap stun into your opener. This can be an incredible play when noting that mages can use Blink to get out of stuns. 
With this method, you can negate all the distance gained by the mage if you can catch them close enough to a wall in the first place. Rogues can also smoke bomb to drop combat on the enemy after a kidney. This opens the window for a more secured stun into blind into sap when you are anticipating an instant trinket after landing the blind. Tip number 26, Hunters. If you use camouflage as a hunter, don't call your pet until after you enter camouflage. This will make your pet be out of camo while you yourself the hunter stay in camo. You can use this to attack demon hunters with eyes or kill totems for free. Also, hunter disengage will not stop rapid fire. I don't know how handy that last one is, but it's pretty neat. Tip number 27 is for monks, and this is a big one. Monks can disarm through die by the sword, preventing the warrior from parrying. Only monk disarm works this way though, because it's a ranged ability and not an attack. Ring of Peace can also be used to get somebody stuck on a wall, and this works best whenever they're in a corner. Tip number 28 for priests, you can use BM Trinket into Desperate Prayer for a huge self-heal. When used properly, this can turn a mid-tier defensive CD into a huge defensive self-heal. You can also use Shadow Word Death when any mage is trying to polymorph you or any rogue is trying to blind you. This will instantly break yourself out of that CC if timed properly. Tip number 29 for all you new rep paladins out there. Shield of Vengeance scales off of your health pool, so using BM Trinket first can make it pop for a massive amount of damage. Also, Divine Steed is off of GCD now, so you can macro it to your Blessing of Freedom for an instant speed boost on your root purges. If you're not playing Divine Auxiliary, you can use Final Reckoning after Divine Toll because Divine Toll is not buffed by Final Reckoning. It doesn't really matter which way you do it. Also, if Execution Sentence is dispelled, it still applies the damage gathered up to that point, just like Warlock's Unstable Affliction. Only Resto Shamans can completely mitigate it via Grounding Totem. Keep in mind that all magic dispels in the game that you can cast on an ally have a minimum of an 8 second cooldown. This makes Purges good to track with Omnibar, along with Kicks. If you see the enemy healer has recently cast a magic dispel, that's the perfect time to start your go with Execution Sentence, as you are guaranteed to work in 8 seconds of damage with it. As for the final verdict versus Justicar's Vengeance debate, one of, if not the best rep paladin in the game for the last many years, Vanguards, has said, Final verdict has a longer range. Justicar's Vengeance is nerfed to 15% stun damage bonus in PvP, and the healing is nerfed too. Justicar's Vengeance is still better for killing and stuns, but I usually prefer the extra range. So, do with that what you will. Tip number 30 for Druids, this is a simple one, you can Cyclone Blessing of Protection. This does technically turn the physical immunity into a complete immunity, but it will keep the enemy healer from topping their health bar off while they're within the physical immunity of Bop. Furthermore, landing that Cyclone on a Bop will allow yourself or one of your teammates to land CC on the healer at the end of your Cyclone to not only negate the bop, but put the person who received the bop in a worse position than they were when they received it. Tip number 31, we're sticking with druids, but this is specifically for feral druids. It's not super nuanced, but feral has a lot of abilities which will turn you into cat form. Tiger's Fury, Dash, Incarn. This is most useful if you're facing hunters and mages, because you can cancel form out of roots and snares, then Tiger's Fury is off global, so you instantly switch back to cat form. In a similar vein to this, using instant roots on healers is a great way to get their dispel. And this one goes for all classes with a root, but if you root a demon hunter on their The Hunt midair, it'll do no damage. This next one is a bug, but if you're attacking a training dummy before an arena, and you use two non-rake combo point generating moves to get within Blood Talons triggering range, when you open with rake, you'll get Blood Talons as if those stacks counted. Additionally, you can use Brutal Slash and Thrash without hitting anything to generate Blood Talons too. That one isn't a bug, but it allegedly can also be done in the starting room. Tip number 32, for Demon Hunters, make a stop casting macro for your The Hunt. This tip can apply to any class that has a telegraphed go cast like The Hunt. It's extremely useful because just casting a spell like The Hunt can scare your enemy into popping a defensive. If they are good, they will not pop the defensive until your hunt has already been cast and the damage is zooming at them. If they are not playing perfectly, or they happen to misplay, then you might get to bait out their defensive, leaving them either defenseless, or at least with a suboptimal answer to your damage. Tip number 33 is actually for Demon Hunter Evoker comps. Something I've noticed whenever you're playing Demon Hunter Evoker in 2s, 
or Demon Hunter Evoker with any DPS and threes against Stealthies is that you can use your eyes from a safe distance while you share your screen on Discord with your Evoker healer who should have Preservation Cloak up. This allows your Evoker healer to see through your eyes while being non-CCable. You can see how absurd this can get. Any class with Demon Hunter and Preservation Evoker should never have to deal with stealth classes, as your healer can just walk up and AoE them out of stealth. Same applies if the Demon Hunter is playing with a Hunter who has Flare from stealth. This strat is significantly weaker when using it with a teammate who can be CC'd, but you may still find it useful. Tip number 34 for Evokers themselves. If you are playing Preservation Evoker and you see that you're about to be polymorphed, a well-timed Dream Projection can be used like Priest's Shadow Word Death for magic effects. Just start the cast at the middle of the poly, and the cancel will purge it off you immediately. It's also worth noting for your Essence Burst and Essence Attunement talents that you should be spamming Living Flame in your downtime. Getting that Essence Burst proc is very much worth fishing for. Tip number 35 for Death Knights. As Frost, never use Empower Rune Weapon without Pillar. Empower makes your pillar go so much faster and smoother so you can fit more crits in that window. For Unholy, you can apply a lot of pressure, but fall short in the burst damage department required to secure a kill. The strength of this spec is applying said pressure, but then becoming a total pain for the enemy healer enough that your other DPS can secure the kill. Between A-bomb limb pull, normal pull, your stun, your silence, your blind, your short range kick, and your heal absorb, you should be able to disrupt healing enough to force a death. If not, then you will definitely pull some CDs from the enemy and will usually be able to secure the kill within the next minute when all your control abilities are back. Death Knights can also be very flexible in how they want to use their offensives depending on the situation. For example, gripping a priest or a lock without using anything else can already be scary enough to bait a fade or a port. Being next to an enemy DK can be a death sentence, no pun intended which is why a simple grip or A-bomb limb can be scary enough to bait out enemy defensives. Now that we've gone through something for every class, we're into the DPS tips. Tip number 36, if you are a DPS, check your healer like it's your rear view mirror in your vehicle. Check where he is to know if you're in range. Check what he's doing to make sure you're within his totems or other spells being cast. Check if he needs to move pillars so that way you can make some space. Check if he has his CDs so you don't overextend. Check if he CC'd so that way you make sure to extra stay in range. Check if they're trying to swap to your healer and be prepared to peel for them. Don't zug and make your healer run out into the open to heal you. It's suicide and won't work past I'd say 1800. With how deflated it is now though, it's 1800 is probably like 1400. This extends to your healer's abilities like totems, monk port, tranquility, priest dome, etc. You can't complain you aren't getting healed if you are letting the enemy mage or druid spam polymorph or cyclone infinitely all game. You also can't complain if you're on your warrior, the gates open, and your first instinct is to run in, heroic leap, charge in, get stunned, and then die. Tip number 37. Don't split DPS. There's only three situations which make sense to split DPS. In one, when the enemy team has a strong single target healer that is keeping their teammate alive, Splitting the damage can force the healer to use their resources to heal multiple targets. Situation 2, when the enemy team has a squishy target that can be quickly bursted down with split damage. This can force the enemy team to waste defensive cooldowns or force the squishy target to retreat, leaving the other target vulnerable. Or Situation 3, when one teammate can't reach the kill target, in which case the damage should be filler and transitory. It's always better to hit something over nothing, but coordinating your damage is key. It's important to remember that splitting damage should only be done strategically and not as a default approach. In most cases, focusing on one target will be more effective in winning the match. Tip number 38, the kill target is dynamic. Don't train one target the entire match no matter what just because that was the initial call, especially if they just popped a defensive CD. The kill target should change based on the remaining enemy defensive CDs. And then tip number 39, just as your kill target is dynamic, so is the enemy team's. Whenever you notice a switch in enemy team's damage, you have to peel for your teammates. It's one thing to know how to kill the other players, but that means nothing if you can't use your abilities to keep your team alive as well. Tip number 40. When getting focused, especially as arranged, quit trying to run away from your healer. Kiting can be important, but too often will new ranged players turn into headless chickens when getting focused without realizing there is no getting away. All you're doing is leaving your healer in the dust. 
Tip number 41, don't forget, hunter and warlock pets can be worth switching to if they are low. Especially easy to do in cleave comps where you hit everything passively. Some specs or classes get a ton of extra damage or utility from their pets, like Beast Mastery and Demonology. This doesn't mean that every time you face these specs that you should focus their pets immediately, because when it's painfully obvious you're going to kill the pet or demon, it's very easy to just heal those pets and you spend the match PvEing instead of PvPing. That's why the keywords here are if they are low. Some strats do revolve around killing the pets as fast as possible. But this tip is just to say, in general, if you see a pet on real low HP, it can be worth a few GCDs to kill it and force the enemy hunter or warlock to find an opening to revive that pet. Tip number 42, we're moving on to healers. It is everyone's job, but the responsibility will often fall on the healer to foresee and predict enemy damage more accurately than their DPS teammates. Pre-walling, pre-bopping, pre-cocooning, pre-tranking can be game-changing. It's not enough to always be reactive. Sometimes you must also be proactive. And as long as you've got the correct UI and add-ons, you should have all the tools you need to predict incoming damage and act accordingly ahead of time. Tip number 43, consider using weak auras to give you a visual or audio cue when your allies cast a big go ability. It really helps switching to an offensive mindset such as cross CC or to help dam when they are doing a go. You can also just use Omni CD to track when your team's big go abilities, or any other ability set to your preferences, are on cooldown. Tip number 44, you should be dispelling specific abilities, not just randomly. For example, Shadow Priest about to ramp up? Make sure your allies are topped before you dispel his dots and take the fear from Vampiric Touch. Is Affliction Lock lighting up your team? Well, prepare for the backlash damage and dispel UA. Having a sharp eye for worthy dispel targets, such as Hodge, is what separates an 1800 healer from a 2400 healer. Dispel poisons off of rogues as well. They hate that. Dispel roots, slows, and other things that are hindering your DPS. This is basically the same tip as CC with intention. Make sure you're dispelling with intention. And for our final tip, number 45, your cooldowns are not just for oh shit moments. Their responses to other cooldowns. Their team is popping cooldowns and your team doesn't have defensives, you use one cooldown. Or when you get more experience, you'll be able to prep for the cooldowns. If you're playing as a preservation evoker and the enemy team blows cooldowns into your double dream plus reversion, then you can keep dealing damage as no one is going to die. It's like pumping into a full hot resto druid. In PvE, generally big healing CDs are used based on how much of your group's HP has fallen. But in PvP, your big healing CDs are your chess pieces. How you use, pace, and position them can completely decide the outcome of a game all on their own. And with that, I've laid out everything I can think to muster to assist you in your climb to gladiator status. But that doesn't mean the tips end there. Let the comment section be your next resource in obtaining and sharing all the information that you think I missed or that have really made the difference in your push this season. I'm very interested in reading what secret tech the PvP community has been hiding from me that I haven't yet discovered. Because more than knowing how to make the biggest numbers appear on screen, WoW PvP is about knowing all the little intricacies of how different spells and abilities interact. The absolutely massive amount of spells and talents in the game that all interact in different ways raise the skill ceiling of this game to such an insane height, and that's what myself and many other PvPers, I'm sure, love about the game. There's just nothing else like it. I'm certain I haven't covered every base, but I hope you've at least learned one thing from this video. And if you did, tell me what it was in the comment section below. I'd love to know what's helped everyone the most and the least. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe as making WoW content is something that I enjoy doing more than anything else and it really helps out the channel. If you want to support me more directly, you can do so on Patreon for just a few bucks. I've uploaded a ton of editing tutorials for DaVinci Resolve over there, and it directly supports my content creation ambitions. So hopefully through those tutorials, it can help support yours too. As always, the link is in the description, and I hope to see you in the next video.